everybody. Um, we'll have to uh, agree a slightly different protocol here because I, I normally do things by show of hands. So if you can hear me clearly, could I, could I have a few shouts back? Fantastic. So when I ask questions and uh, ask for responses, if we can do a few shouts rather than uh, shows of hands, that would be fantastic. Um, first thing I want to do is apologize for not being there in person today. Um, unfortunately, my wife was taken ill recently and uh, over the last couple of weeks suffered, suffered a couple of falls necessitating visits to A&E. So the thought of uh, being four hours away from her today was, was a little bit too much to contemplate, particularly as she's uh, currently awaiting surgery in the next couple of weeks. So I do hope you'll understand, and I do hope we can still manage to have um, a very good hour session and, and maybe some uh, conversation and dialogue as part of that. So. To introduce myself, I'm the Chief Information Officer at Durham University. I've been here about six months and uh, have been rapidly getting up to speed with the challenges that are particular to Durham and also, um, I think, gen generic across the sector. Um, this afternoon, I'm, I'm going to stay away from all matters technology and actually focus on not what we do, but how we do it and how the way we do things can have something of a significant impact on the results we get and the relationships we build within our institutions. I think some of the things I will say this afternoon may challenge some of you, and that's a good thing. Hopefully it will resonate with some of you, and others may find it um, not something that's, that's relevant to them or what they do and the way that they do it, and all, all of that's fine. There are no right or wrong answers in any of this. Um, to those of you I've met before, it's nice to reacquaint with you over the video. And for those of you who haven't met before, um, it's nice to uh, be able to present to you this afternoon. So if we move on to the first slide, uh, we'll start with a little bit of a sobering thought. Um, I often find that Dilbert is a useful source of uh, conscience, inspiration, and uh, a sense check of many things. And if we look at this cartoon, what we see is someone who is trying to be innovative, creative, put their ideas forward. But if we look at the last part of the cartoon, what's the response they're getting? How might we all feel if that was the response we got from a leader or a colleague or someone in a position of authority within our institutions. I'm reminded of a little cartoon I was shown once that said, we value creativity in this organization, and here's the rule book for how we do it. How often do we feel that freedom, that ability, that opportunity to really think openly and to think freely within our organizations? And if we don't, how can we create that opportunity? And that's a little bit of what I'd like to talk about this afternoon and also talk about some techniques that we can use when we're interacting within our colleagues, with our colleagues in our own institutions that might just improve the outcomes we get when we're in those situations. So, what are the sort of ingredients that we look for in our institutions and in our organizations? Well, when I'm approaching a situation, be that a project, a strategy, a change program, one of the things I like to think about are the different elements that are involved. And Galbraith's model is a good one. It talks about strategy. It talks about structure. It talks about processes, rewards, and people. All of those, I think, are quite important and, in fact, essential elements in anything that we are contemplating doing. I would argue that often the balance changes. We probably sometimes spend too much time on processes and structure and strategy and perhaps not enough time on people and rewards. All of the elements are important. 
but how about if we had a different approach? How about if we had a different way of thinking? Now, this is the first opportunity to uh, have a little bit of a shout back at me. How many people have watched films like Star Wars, The Matrix, and that type of film? Yep, we've got quite a few people who understand that. Well, if you've watched those films, they follow a very ancient storytelling structure that came from Greek mythology and others before that even. And it's a very classical way of telling a story. Well, if you go and read a book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces by Joseph Campbell, what Campbell gives us is a way of starting to think about change in those terms of classic mythology. The framework's called The Hero's Journey, and I've used this in a number of organizational change contexts. And so if we have a look at The Hero's Journey, you'll start to see that we have at its, at its, at its foundation the call to action. The call to action is when we need to recognize that change needs to happen. And what, the, what, what very often happens, if uh, it has appeared successfully on the screen, is that you will have denial. People will deny in very different ways. They will say, we don't need to change. We don't need to do that. Uh, we're fine as we are. We can carry on just as we are. And actually, what sits behind that is a, is a mix of fear and excitement. People will be excited about changing. Some people will be very fearful of changing. Um, one of the most interesting feed, pieces of feedback I ever had during a change process was from, a, from a, a bunch of senior people in an organization who said that people are very fearful of the process that we're about to embark upon, and others are fearful that you might just succeed. So there was that mix of fear about actually going on the journey, and actually a mix of fear of where we might get to as we went through that journey. So the call to action. So once we've had the call to action, then we go into preparation. We're all very used to preparing for change. We have to write endless business cases. We have to write uh, documents for our senior stakeholders. We'll have to write change plans. We might even have to write program definitions. That's all part of preparation. And organizations will either spend way too much time in preparation or not enough time in preparation. Um, I can imagine there are people in the room who've got caught in that preparatory phase and been in that for too long. Um, I'll give you an example here at Durham. Uh, we, had a, we had a project that was actually in that preparation phase for almost five years. And when I came here six months ago, it still had not got to the point of starting. And within a couple of months, we really had got hold of that project and we'd actually got it underway because there were some very, very good reasons why if it didn't start soon, then the institution was going to be in some very difficult circumstances. So actually, you can spend too long in preparation. Also, preparation involves not just the business case, the documentation, but also thinking about the people. Who needs to be prepared? Who needs to understand this change process? Who needs to be consulted? Who needs to be part of the, the community of people that are driving the change? So when we get beyond preparation, we get to the point of escape. And as we appoint, approach the, the point of escape, this is where our special characters will start to appear. They're the ones who will help us launch the change process successfully. If you think of classical storytelling, we can all see who the special characters are. In Star Wars, it's Obi-Wan Kenobi. He acts as the guide to Luke Skywalker. He guides him through the journey that he's about, about to embark on. If you think about the Matrix, it's Morpheus as he guides Neo through the challenges that face him. 
whether he's deciding to take the red pill or the blue pill or anything else that happens throughout the journey of the matrix. Well, in our change programs, we'll have those special characters. They could be senior stakeholders in the organization. They could be external consultants. They could be mentors. They could be coaches. They could be guides. But those, spe those special characters will help us navigate through the preparation and prepare to face the point of escape. Now, the point of escape is always guarded by monsters. If you go right back in mythology, think about Jason and the Argonauts, think about Hercules. Whenever he went to the point of escape, there were always monsters to be confronted and dealt with. But my experience over the years is as we confront those monsters, actually, they're just learning, dressed up in furry suits. They might look scary. They might look uncomfortable, they might look difficult, they might look challenging. But as we get close to them and as we really understand those monsters that are preventing us from escaping, we learn from them, we grow from them, and we actually move forward in a much better way. Now what often happens is we reach the point of escape and the monsters seem too scary, so we go back into preparation. I can imagine quite a few of us have done that. I have myself. But once we get past that point of escape, we're into the change process and we're underway. And so what happens then is we're on the road of trials. And I always describe this as like a roller coaster. There'll be ups, there'll be downs. And we meet those ups and downs in the same way, with the same energy, the same enthusiasm, and the same opportunities that we that we face and that we might want to grasp. Um, some of them will be challenging. Some of them will be uncomfortable. We might believe that we can't overcome many of them. But actually, we continue to move forward. And as we, as we travel along the road of trials, our skills will develop and we will grow as individuals. And then, of course, as we come to the end of the road of trials, we reach the homecoming. The more technical of monsters might call that our benefits set or our outcomes. But the homecoming is the prize. It's the reason we went on the journey in the first place. And I have to say, I see a number of change programs where when we set off, we have great ambition. When we get to the end, we've often forgotten what the prize really was because the journey we've been on bears no resemblance to the one we set out upon. So that's the hero's journey. And it's, a, it's an interesting framework that you might consider using with people in your institution or your organization that actually brings a very different energy, narrative, and feel to a change process. It feels a lot less technical. It feels a lot less rule-bound. And it has some opportunities to start to tell stories and to encourage people to think differently by using different language and different metaphors. So the next thing I want to think about is what level are we changing? Are we thinking about the right levels? Are we focusing on the wrong level? It was Einstein who said, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking with which we created them. And so if we're thinking about change and we're thinking about issues that we need to confront, it's useful to think about what level is that problem? And how do we need to think differently and approach it differently to achieve change? So if we move on to the next slide, this is a very simple model that says, actually, we're looking for results when we're making a change. We want to be different in some way, whatever different might be. And it's those results that are important to us. Now, very often, we focus on the activity level. So if I take an, an example in a university, timetabling is a perennial issue. We're all challenged by timetabling. We all want to make changes to how we do timetabling and how we present the outputs and the outcomes. 
And I often hear the language of we need different processes, we need different systems, we need different templates, we need different documents. All of that is at the activity level. It's always the things we do. Well, actually, very often to really achieve that change and to solve the problems we've created, we need to go up one level and we need to think about behaviors and beliefs. So when people come into a timetabling process, what are they believing? What are the beliefs that they hold dear? If they're an academic who has to deliver teaching, what do they believe about the timetabling process? If they're an administrator who has the challenging task of making the timetable work, what do they believe? How do the academics behave towards the timetabling staff? How do the timetabling staff behave towards the academics? When you start to think about these different dimensions, you start to have different conversations. So let's, let's do another little one of my shouting tests. How many people in the room have a to-do list every day? Yeah. How many people also have a to-be list? No. So every day we go in and focus on what we need to do. But what about focusing on how we need to be that day to get success? That was really brought home to me a few years ago. I was doing a piece of work for a, for a client when I was working for myself. And um, I was traveling up on the train. And this was a quite complex change process. And we'd reached um, something of a fork in the road. And I was sat on the train and I was thinking about this meeting. And I found myself saying to myself, mm, this is going to be difficult, this meeting. It's going to be challenging. It's going to be really difficult to get a consensus. And I'm not sure that we'll actually get to an outcome. And as you can imagine, I walked into the room. And that's exactly what happened. It was a challenging meeting. It was a difficult discussion. We didn't achieve a consensus. And actually, it was quite confrontational. So two weeks later, I had a follow-up meeting. And I was sat on the train. And I was traveling up to the client's site. And I found myself thinking about the meeting ahead. And I thought, oh, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be challenging. And I thought, no, stop. And I actually started to think some different thoughts that perhaps this meeting could be constructive, that we could actually focus on a positive outcome, that we could find some common ground, and that we might get a different result. And sure enough, at the end of a 90-minute meeting, we'd established some common ground, we'd made some progress, we'd had a constructive discussion, and the whole change process had moved forward. And the one thing that was different in that meeting was me. It was my energy, it was my focus, and it was my approach. Actually, that helped the people in the room to also be different. And rather than focusing on what we were doing and a set of papers and an agenda, we were actually thinking about how we were behaving and how we were, how we were being. And actually, I was thinking about what I'd been believing about that meeting as I was traveling up on the train. So when you're approaching change situations and when you're in that difficult place of thinking about the conversations that you need to have. It's always worth thinking about the beliefs, the behaviors that actually underpin the activities. So let's move on again. Maybe even some of you might start to think about a to-be list. So let me just check in with you. How many of you have come across the concept of cause and effect? A few. I'm hearing a few murmurs. This was something I learned about a few years ago, probably a few being closer to 10 years ago. And it was something that had a profound impact for me in terms of how I approached my work. Um, so if we think about being at cause, I describe that as being action-oriented. Action -oriented. If we think about being an effect, I describe that as being excuses and, and reasons why not. Um, I guess from the university world, my favorite example of people being at effect is 
when someone turned to me once in a discussion about change and they said, of course, John, the university just won't let us do that. I'd be interested, have any of you ever in your work met that type of response? Yeah. It is quite common, and actually that's a wonderful effect statement. Because what is this thing called the university that suddenly has a personality and an identity and is able to issue instructions? And what does the that in the sentence mean? The university just won't let us do that. So my response to that is, who specifically in the university won't let us do what specifically? And when you ask that question, it's very interesting to see what happens. So that's a classic at effect statement. So it's, I can't do it. I don't know. It's, it's them, not me. Often when working with senior leaders in organizations, they used to invite me in and say, we need to change things within this organization. And I'd hear, and of course, they need to change, not me. Well, actually change as Gandhi said famously, be the change you want to see in the world. It starts from within. And actually, if you're a leader and you want to change a situation, the first question I would ask myself in that situation is, how am I creating this situation? What do I need to do and how do I need to be different? So that's being at effect. Being at cause is about taking responsibility. It's about being action-oriented. It's about being causal. So if you're taking responsibility, you find out how you can. You find out what you can do, what you can say, what action you can take in a situation. You're responsible for how you're being. You're responsible for the energy you're bringing into the situation and how you use your time. So an effect statement is, I'm really sorry, I don't have time for that. Whereas actually, alternatively, you could say, I'm not able to do that now, but I will be able to come back to you tomorrow. That's a much more causal statement, and actually we'll get a different outcome. There's a very good book by a gentleman called William Urry, which I'll save you the trouble of reading, because it's, uh, it's a typical you know, sort of 200-page book. But what Urry introduces is the power of a positive no. And what he says in that book is the idea of a construct that goes yes, no, yes. So if someone comes to me with a question, my response might be, yes, I'd really like to help you with that situation. No, I can't do exactly what you're asking. Yes, I will do the following, and I'll do it within the next week. That's a positive no. I've actually said I can't do what they want me to do. But actually, I frame that with two yes statements. Yes, I want to help you. No, I can't do what you want me to do. And yes, I will do the following in a given time frame. And that's a construct that I encourage you all to use if it feels right and appropriate for you. So that's a little bit about cause and effect. And it's something that when you're working with other people, Watch out for those effect statements and think about how in the discussion or in the dialogue you can help people to change them into causal statements. That might be a question like who or what. Or it might just be a qualification to ask them what the basis is for that statement. It might be about how they're feeling particularly about a situation. Whatever the right question is, try and find it and try and ensure that actually you move to a causal outcome rather than sitting in a situation of effect which makes it very, very difficult to move things forward. So on the next slide, this is one of my favorites. I've actually seen people in relationships go around this triangle without saying a word. This is the drama triangle. And it comes from Stephen Kaupman's work. So there's three roles within the drama triangle. And I'm sure we've experienced them all. 
First one is persecutor, often delivered with a pointed finger and a very loud tone of voice. Um, statements like, you better sort that out or else. That's absolutely beautiful persecutor language. Yeah, it's done with a particular tone of voice. It can have a particular body, body posture associated with it. And it will often come with a gesture. And the thing about persecutor, like all of these positions on the drama triangle, is it's one up, one down. So the persecutor is trying to have power over the other individual and actually say that I'm stronger, more powerful, or more influential in this situation than you are, and I'm going to exert my power over you in a rather unhelpful way. The second one is rescuer, often evidenced by people putting on their Superman pants, and they might turn around to you, or superwoman pants, uh, and they might turn around to you and say, that's all right, I'll sort that out. Leave it with me, I'll take care of it. What they're doing is rescuing you. They're saying it's no longer your problem. I've got everything that's needed in that situation to sort it out. So I'm going to rescue you. And then the victim position is often accompanied by a very soft tone of voice, a very placatory, palms upwards type gesture. It's not me. It's not my fault. It was nothing to do with me. I'm just a victim in this situation. And all of those positions, whichever one you take, are one up, one down positions. The rescuer is again trying to show that they're more able, capable, powerful than you. And the victim is actually showing that they're, they're weaker, they're much less strong, they're not accepting responsibility, and therefore it's a very weak position. Now you watch as you go back into your conversations in your institutions how dialogue moves around the drama triangle. If someone goes to persecutor, then people will either go to a victim position or they'll go to a rescuer position. If someone goes to a victim, they're likely to be persecuted or others will go to them and rescue them. And if someone goes to the rescuer position, they invite the persecutor or they invite the victim who wants to be rescued. So what do we do in this situation? Well, actually, we move to adult. And the adult position is the one that breaks the drama triangle. I have to confess, by the way, that chocolate is the one thing that can get me to move through all three positions on the drama triangle seamlessly. So if I've had a bad day, I'll start from victim, which is, I've had a really bad day, I need chocolate, I'm going to go and get some chocolate. I'll then go to persecutor, which says, you're carrying a lot of weight, or words to that effect. Uh, you don't need chocolate, it's not good for you, you shouldn't have chocolate. And then I'll go to rescuer, which is, don't worry, go and get the chocolate, eat the chocolate, enjoy the chocolate and ignore those other two voices. So that's a quick move around the drama triangle just on the topic of chocolate. The other thing to note as well with this is where do you tend to go when you're under stress? If you're in a stressful situation, you will naturally gravitate to one of the three positions. You'll either go to persecutor, you'll either go to rescuer, or you'll go to victim. I have to say my tendency is to go to rescuer and I've often been in situations where when under stress my reaction has been don't worry I'll sort it out and found myself working excessively long hours trying to solve too many problems on my own and actually having a really adverse impact on my own health and well-being which is not a great thing to do but as you become aware of that you become better able to manage it and better able to deal with it. So that's a little bit about the drama triangle. And I do encourage you, as you go back to your institutions, just to be aware of that and see how it plays out in your institutions and your organizations. The final thing I want to talk about is rapport. 
rapport is a fundamental underpinning of how we interact as human beings. Can I just check in with you by my shouting method? How many of you have come across rapport before? Yeah, a few of you. Good. So rapport is about responsiveness. It's not necessarily about liking people. You don't actually have to be in rapport. Sorry, you don't actually have to like someone to be in rapport. You can be in very effective rapport with someone, but you may not like them at all. It works at an unconscious level. We all do it naturally. We're often not aware of it. And equally, we're then also not aware of when we're not in rapport with people. And as you start to focus on the reactions you're getting in a given situation and the way people are responding to you, you start to become aware of when you're in rapport and when you're not in rapport. And if you want to be a little bit Machiavellian, it's quite interesting to try breaking rapport deliberately and seeing what happens. So sometimes if you're in rapport with someone, you can very easily break rapport by just having a look at your watch or um, just doing something where you look out the window or you look away, and you're guaranteed you'll break rapport. And see what reaction you get. See how that uh, changes the dynamic in the conversation. Often best tried with friends and family rather than, a, rather than in a work situation initially. But as you become more aware of it, you can start to work with it more effectively. It also gives you a capability to see other points of view and other people's point of view. So if you're in rapport, the ability to see other people's perspective and understand the dynamics of a situation becomes that much easier. And some people describe it as being like being on each other's wavelength. So let's go to the next slide. There are three aspects to rapport. The first one is about the physiology. Many of you might have experienced the situation where if you're in very, very good rapport with someone, you'll actually find your breathing synchronizes. You actually find that you're breathing at the same rate. You're completely in sync. You take a look at each other and you actually look identical in terms of the, the physiological position that you've taken up. There are, there are two ways of noticing rapport. One is about matching. So that's where you'll have similarities between two people. So they may have their hand in the same position. They may have their hand up to their chin. And they're both doing a, a gesture like that. Or leg crossing is a, is a good one. You, you often will see in a room who's what we call the rapport leader. Because if they cross their legs, you watch. There'll be other people in the room that will also cross their legs at the same time and follow them. And then mirroring, that's doing the opposite. So if someone sat with their hand like that, someone else might be sat with their hand like that. And they're actually mirroring that other person, but they're still in a very good sense of rapport. So on the next slide, let's have a look at a couple of examples of that. The first one is Mr. Cameron and Barack Obama. And as you can see, obviously in deep rapport. You see the matching there where the hands are to the chin and the physiological position with the other arm across the front of their body is very similar. A really good indicator of two people in good rapport. The second example is Mr. Blair and Mr. Bush. They're actually mirroring. So Mr. Blair has his left hand up to his chin and Mr. Bush has his right hand up to his chin. They're still in rapport. They're just mirroring each other. Um, as a little aside, I don't know if we have any George Bush uh, quote connoisseurs in the room, but my favorite George Bush quote ever is the one where he said, the problem with the French is they have no word for entrepreneur. So uh, he brought as many words of wisdom. Um, I think my other favorite was when he said that, uh, he proudly said that the United States was in Europe and was part of Europe. 
I think that demonstrated that he was rather geographically challenged. So there we have examples of matching and mirroring, very important concepts and rapport. And when you're in a room, they're the sorts of things you can pick up on. Who am I in rapport with? Who is the rapport leader in this situation? And as you work with that and you think about that more, you'll start to pick up on it and it will start to help you tune in more carefully to the situations and the dynamics within a room. Why it works. This is um, Burns Law of Attraction. People are drawn to people that are like them. So actually we find it easier to get into rapport with people that are like us and slightly more difficult to get into rapport with people who are not like us. So often it's finding that common ground, it's finding that area of common interest and as people start to feel that there's more of a similarity and a commonality, the rapport becomes easier. And of course always remember the theory of communication. Seven percent of communication is the words that we say. 38% is the tone of voice that we use and 55% is our physiology. One of the very interesting pieces of work I did some years ago was actually helping people who work in call centers. Because if you think about being on a telephone call with a customer, you've immediately taken away 55% of the communication impact. There's no physiology unless you're on a video phone call. So all you have to work with are the words you use and the tone of voice. And so on the telephone, voice becomes even more important and even more impactful. And of course, if you're using email, you've lost physiology and tone of voice. All you've got are the words that are on the page. So you've got about 7% of the wriggle room that you had in other communication situations. So rapport is very important and very useful to us and can be quite impactful in the way that we work. So in terms of all of this, a final thought really, I'd pull it all together with the words of Henry Ford. If you believe you can or you believe you can't, you will be right. I think that is echoed very clearly by my example of the meeting situation. In the first trip to meet with those customers and clients in that meeting, I didn't believe I could. I didn't think I could find a positive outcome. I didn't think I could have a constructive discussion. And I didn't think I could find my way through that situation. And sure enough, I was right. And on the second meeting, I started to believe some different things. And I started to believe some different things about the situation and about myself. And sure enough, I got a different outcome. And I was right. So one of the things that I did a few years ago was start to pay quite close attention to the things that I say to myself. Now, it's a pretty strange admission when you start to talk about hearing voices in your head. And uh, I'm not going to ask people to tell me whether they do that or not. But we all have self-talk. We all have things that we say to ourselves quietly that we never actually voice. And it's very interesting to pay attention to that self-talk. Because in your average human being, a large percentage of that self-talk is negative. We're saying negative things to ourselves. So if you catch yourself doing that, just experiment with turning some of it positive and see what impact it has. If you believe you can or you believe you can't, you will be right. So thank you very much. Thank you for listening. And I apologize again profusely that I couldn't be with you in person. But I hope uh, there's been some food for thought in the last session that I've just delivered and I hope you will understand that it was some fairly exceptional circumstances that meant that I couldn't travel today. So thank you all very much for listening and if there are questions I'll be absolutely delighted to spend a little bit of time answering those questions. Thank you.
are, are we able to answer, ask any questions or can we relay them to John? Because we've got a bit of time that we worth that we can try here. They are, aren't they? The sessions are being videoed. I think they are, yeah, yeah. And the presentations will be available as well. Can we, yeah? There's no way to get the audio back, so uh, the only way to disconnect is you could ask a question by you could maybe write questions down. Do you want to try it or? So we're going to try this, it may or may not work, so um, if you have any questions, um, how do you want to do this? <laughs> okay, I, I think this, this uh, just the, the complexity of this, it may not actually work unfortunately, but but I'm sure um, um, anybody has John's email or be, uh, we provide it in the, in the, in the session notes that um, he'd be more than happy to kind of take um, any questions um, by email. Um, fortunately, we've actually managed to, obviously the, the session went a bit quicker than, than, than envisaged because of the, the way we've had to do it. Um, the next session's not due to start until, until quarter two, which is about an hour. So I don't know whether we want the um, start early again or whether we want the just kind of take a bit of extra time for tea and coffee or? Oh, we have it working? Oh, good, good. Yeah, we'll, we'll, do, we'll do that for five or ten minutes. So if anybody has any questions, if you want to actually speak them to the back, um, they can be relayed to John. I don't know how this will work, but it's worth a try. So. Anybody, any questions you want to try and ask John, sir? I found that pie chart with the communication uh, very useful. If you think that only 7% is the written part and you're reading an email, but you're reading it and you're reading it with voice, so you're hearing the words said in a voice in your head. And if you're also, when you're reading it, you're visualizing the person and how they, you think they're standing, then, my goodness, you're adding so much of the wrong communication to that. So you're reading an email, but in, the, in your head, the person is shouting, and their face is twisted, and their, you know, their, their, their body language is towards you, and you know, they're really angry. Uh, yeah, I can imagine that. I, I, I'm really cautious with email. So it's not a question, but it uh, yeah, clarifies for me. As, certainly, we've all seen it. I suppose it's, you do lose that person side of it, and, and you, you, there's so much context. I, I think it's worse. It's not just, that you, context, yeah. not just that you lose the person, but you in, insert a different person, yeah. or the person that you think you're speaking to, or the yeah. person that you're already annoyed with. Any questions? Or? Correctly, we're, we're talking about the, the, in the communication model, the 7% of uh, the impact that comes from the words and within an email. Um, we, all, we all make visual representations of those sorts of situations. And actually, it's a risky business. Because um, I always remember uh, I had uh, a, a very interesting tutor early in my career who taught us presentation skills. And he was, a, he was a gentleman, sadly no longer with us, called Eric Beatty. And he came in and he said to us, he said, uh, presentation skills, it's very easy. He said, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and tell them what you told them. And that was it. That was Eric's lesson. But the other thing he put up on the board was he put the word assume up on the board. And he split it up and said, assume it makes an ass of you and me. And that's what we're doing when we make visual representations all the time. We're making assumptions about what people's intention was behind the words they put in an email. And we will all make those assumptions. And if you think about communication, communication happens when 
there is actually a dialogue between, between the two ends of that process. And actually, often we get into email dialogue that we'd rather not get into purely because of those interpretations of the words where people have made assumptions about the voice tonality or even the physiology that sits behind it. So I, I agree with what you're saying in terms of the care that we need to take when we're communicating via email. Hi John, this is Laura Morris from the University of Kent. One of the things that you mentioned was about the project that you'd had sort of in planning phase for the last five years and you were actually starting to get some traction on that now that it was becoming particularly urgent. Can you just tell me a bit more about how you're actually starting to move that forward and maybe some lessons that you're learning for the institution as well that we could take on board? To, I, I think um, the first thing was to actually make sure that you had the right people coming together. So very important in that situation was understanding who the key stakeholders really were. The second thing was accepting that there was a very clear imperative for that piece of work. So. I often work with an old model that IBM introduced in the 60s about different types of benefit. And one of the things they talk about are seven types of benefit in a project. But there's actually an eighth that they describe as well, which is called risk avoidance. And actually, one of the things that IBM said many years ago was if you have a risk avoidance project, just get on and do it. Keep the scope as sensible and minimal as you can and, and get on and sort the risk. So actually part of that process is getting people to face up to the reality and actually getting them to stare down what will happen if. And in this situation, it was what will happen if we don't deal with this situation. So in a sense, you're taking them to their crisis reality. It's a little bit like a Dr. Pepper moment, isn't it? What's the worst that can happen? And as long as you confront that crisis reality, that worst case situation, it actually gives you a very strong platform then to drive action. Somebody very cheekily once said to me, they said, if you're a CIO and you're actually putting forward your um, submission for the annual budget round, make sure you have an outage about two days before the budget decision is made. It's the best way to fo focus people's minds on the need to continue investing. But that was what we did, was we got the right stakeholders together we actually then confronted the reality of the situation and the consequences that would happen if we didn't deal with it. And then we very quickly charted a course and mobilized some resources that could actually get us to a point where we could sign off uh, an investment plan to actually make it happen. And that, that process took about two months. And in two months, we actually moved further forward as an institution than we had in the previous five years. And uh, cause and effect was also at play because there was a lot of people giving good reasons why we couldn't do things. And actually, when you started to challenge some of that, it fell away. When you, when you found that it didn't fall away, those either became aspects of the work that needed to be done or they became risks to be managed and mitigated. Any more questions? Okay, well, thank that you then. For listening. Oh, sorry. And I, I do hope we managed to uh, provoke, um, perhaps uh, inform, and maybe prompt some questions despite me not being able to be there in person. So, thank you again.